broadcast is now starting. Oh, hello everyone. Welcome to this month's Pixel Mill webinar. My name is Michael Wells. I'm the Partnerships Community Manager here at Pixel Mill, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to this month's offering of Evolving SharePoint and Office 365 Development, A New World of Opportunities. As you can see, we're trying something a little new this month and possibly further on, uh, where we're gonna be doing a little more live interaction with you guys. Uh, when our speaker comes on in a little bit, you'll see his face pop up. Um, he'll be chatting with you guys a little bit while, throughout his session, so you'll get to actually see Eric's bright, shiny face. Um, all the usual stuff that you're used to. If you have any questions or comments, <clears throat> there is a chat box for you guys to use. Uh, our questions box and a chat box. Throw your questions and comments in there. I will be keeping track of those as it goes on. Um, my face will pop up when there's a question and we'll kind of work through that. If we are not able to get to those questions uh, during the session, uh, we do have a 15 minute Q&A as always at the end of the session. So no worries, we will get to your questions as best we can. Uh, for those of you who are more, uh, into the social media kind of thing, feel free um, to use the hashtag Pixel Mill Webinars if you'd rather um, contact us that way. I'll keep in track of our Twitter feed as well on that. Um, at Pixel Mill Team is also our Twitter account, so feel free to hit us up there. But without further ado, let me introduce our speaker for this month. He is our president and co-founder and one heck of a guy, Eric Overfield. All Take it away, right. Eric. Can you all hear me just fine? Yes. Excellent, excellent, well, good. Yeah, we're gonna have some fun trying this uh, this new thing out. So we're looking forward to having a good hour here. Um, what I wanted to talk about this morning was talking about the evolution of SharePoint uh, development. Now, we did a session about this around six, seven, seven uh, months ago, and a lot has changed. So I thought it was time to kind of revisit this. Now, some of my initial stuff will be uh, reviewed for some of you, which is great, no worries. But uh, don't worry, I got a lot of new stuff in store for you. So I'm looking forward to having a, a really good time here. So with that, let's kind of go ahead and, and move forward. First of all, just so you know who I am, uh, for those of you I have not had the pleasure of meeting yet, my name is Eric Overfield. I am president, co-founder of Pixelmill. I'm also a, a Microsoft Regional Director, uh, Microsoft MVP, uh, community organizer located in the California region, although I have the pleasure speaking all over the world on SharePoint, Office 365, Azure development, kind of building cool uh, portals and having a lot of fun. Great ways to get a hold of me. If you just can remember my name, of course, at Eric Overfield or ericoverfield.com. A little bit about who Pixamil is. Really appreciate, really appreciate you joining us today. Uh, Pixamil, we're a digital design agency based out of California. And our primary focus is helping our clients successfully utilize Office 365, uh, SharePoint and Azure to build really successful uh, portals and, and intranets and extranets that are geared around driving that user adoption. Uh, just because you build it doesn't mean they're gonna show up. We look to help make sure that our, your users are gonna build and use the portals that you helped, that we help you develop um, because they're useful, because they actually provide the interface and the functionality that they need. Okay, so our agenda for today, what I thought we can go over here. I was gonna go ahead and, and talk again with a review of some of the traditional models that we use uh, to, to work with the SharePoint platform. These models are still valid. We still can use them in SharePoint 2016, and I assume, haven't seen it yet, but SharePoint 2019 still has some uh, some of these old classic techniques that we can use for on-prem. But of course, we wanna look towards the cloud. I'm sure a lot of us are looking towards what we can do with the cloud. We'll then look at more modern SharePoint development techniques. What's the newer, better way, shall we say, of working with SharePoint? Um, and then we go ahead and say, okay, well, what's the roadmap? Where's Microsoft trying to take us? And then I thought we could end with, okay, what's, what, what are my opinions on how is the best strategy forward for you? And that's kind of where I'm hoping we get out at the end of this discussion here is what's gonna be the right model for you circa 2018, maybe into the 2019 era. It's, it's uh, February of 2018 right now, uh, for those of you who are watching this uh, later on. So, you know, in two, three years, of course, this whole idea of what's available will most likely have changed a little bit. But for now, for our portals we're building now, this is important stuff. So let's look at what's existing in SharePoint development. What has, what's the history been? How have we gotten to where we're at? Um, and uh, what is still available and what we should definitely stay away from. Okay, back in the SharePoint 2007 days, in order to work with SharePoint, in order to create those custom solutions we were looking for, we were building full trust farm solutions. And this is really all we had. It worked. It gave us full control of SharePoint. We can go in and totally mess things up if we uh, really were, were so inclined to do it. Um, but the thing that's interesting is, is that 
this is still an available technique that we can use for all the way up to 2013, 2016 for sure, including SharePoint 2019. I assume, I can't tell you for sure because I haven't looked at it too much or I can't share what I do know, but I would think that Full Trust Solutions will still be available in 2019. It's just that it is definitely not cloud friendly. Cloud, the cloud, SharePoint Online does not in any way allow for Full Trust Solutions and we can safely assume that's not gonna happen anytime soon. Full Trust Solutions do typically, for 99% of us, they require Visual Studio. We're gonna be using that to build our solution, build our code, build the solution package called a WSP that we're gonna push up into the farm. We would have to take these solutions and install them at our tenant level uh, in SharePoint on-prem using either the central admin or a lot of us are using PowerShell to do this kind of stuff. So you needed a lot of access into your SharePoint farm and for a good reason, because of the power of what Full Trust Solutions could do. A lot of uh, a lot of our clients, in particular, a lot of clients that I've seen, they don't even allow Full Trust Solutions because it's just too dangerous. You can take down a whole farm with one misplaced line of code and that's just not overly good. But if you do need full control, if you need to do some really deep stuff in this SharePoint and you're on-prem, then hey, you can still use Full Trust Solutions. They work just fine. In 20, uh, SharePoint 2010, the Microsoft started to realize, okay, this cloud thing might be important. We needed a way to isolate some code uh, at a site collection level, something that you could, you could build a WSP, you could build some custom code, but it was ran in an isolated uh, uh, container so that you really couldn't hurt anybody else. In theory, and it worked pretty well, uh, in theory that sort of happened, but there were some bugs, but whatever, we'll, we'll leave that. Sandbox solutions are still available in 2010, 2013, 2016, and again, kind of assuming 2019. Uh, and they are available in SharePoint Online in a very specific way. Uh, in general, you might have heard that sandbox solutions have been deprecated, uh, and that is true because sandbox solutions can still include custom code. They can include uh, some custom C-sharp code. That is no longer allowed in SharePoint Online at all. What is available, in SharePoint Online on Sandbox Solutions is something called the declarative only solution. This is a solution where you're basically telling your solution, hey, I just want to uh, set up some site columns, some content types, et cetera, something that could be built into an XML document without any custom C-sharp code. That's still available in SharePoint Online. That has not been deprecated in any way that I've heard, uh, and it is still available. It's not ideal, there are better methods, but it, it's if you've got a bunch of code base, based on uh, classic SharePoint experiences and you're looking to move to the cloud, this is something uh, that you can still move and probably migrate without too much difficulty. Sandbox solutions do require Visual Studio still, or again, for 99.9% .9 of us, they're gonna require Visual Studio to create that WSP that we need to install into SharePoint. Uh, we do not need to install this via central admin, nor do we need to do it via PowerShell. You can install WSP uh, sandbox solutions via the uh, via the browser at the site collection level, which is kind of nice. So you can, a, a, uh, a site admin, not necessarily a tenant admin, can, can upload a, uh, a sandbox solution in their site collection that they have access to, and they would just make changes to just that site collection. So you've really isolated them really well. But you can install them via PowerShell or via Central Admin if you wanted to make them available uh, across your tenant. At the SharePoint Online level, you don't have that quite control. Really, sandbox solutions are designed at SharePoint Online uh, just for the site collection level. So sandbox solutions are there. Uh, they work. Uh, I would not recommend in any way you take uh, new code and move them into the sandbox solutions. There are definitely better ways. Uh, but if you have existing solutions that you built using sandbox solutions and you're looking to move to the cloud, I'm not going to just say don't do it. You might want to then say, hey, can we just move these solutions because we've already invested in them and move them to the cloud and maybe migrate them to a, a new or better way uh, in the future and focus right now just on your straight up migration uh, to the cloud. Okay, so sandbox solutions were good, but they weren't quite perfect. There were definitely some issues uh, with the cloud. So Microsoft said, oh, okay, well, let's try something else. Let's make it a little better. Let's allow for some custom code, so that C-sharp code, let's say. Let's ha have some custom code that can be offloaded from SharePoint. And that's where the add-on model came around. This was created in SharePoint 2013, again, 2016, probably 2019. And, and this is cloud friendly. We can do this in SharePoint Online. Uh, without really any any differences. 
So what add-ons allow us to do is to create a, a front-end experience using more like HTML and JavaScript and then offload the coding aspect in a, in a secure, isolated way in some other service, say on our own, um, our own tenant, maybe some other farm that we've created, or maybe Azure where we've stored the custom code, the, the custom business logic outside of SharePoint because that's really actually where the web is going. Uh, your websites typically just present the data, but they don't, the web servers are not doing uh, heavy business logic themselves. Often that's that's offloaded to more of like an application server, which is designed to just take input and shoot out output. It's just that you've, you've asked me to do something, I'm gonna go ahead and send that out. The add-in model allows for that. Now there are two primary ways to host uh, your SharePoint add-ins or something called a SharePoint host hosted add-in, which is a, um, which is where everything itself is stored within SharePoint. This is typically done or really only can be done when your add-in doesn't have that custom C-sharp code where it's all based on HTML and JavaScript and all the business logic is something that can happen at the, um, at the browser level, something that can happen in the client. And if you needed business logic, you may be using maybe a REST API or something to go communicate with something else and then get the data back. Now there's another methodology, which is something called a provider hosted add-in where a, another service, maybe Azure or something, is storing the backend code, that custom C-sharp code, let's say, and basically you're building a front end on the add-in and then that's communicating with your backend. It works, again, uh, it's totally still valid and there are definitely use cases right now where this would be important, uh, even with modern SharePoint development because of its ability for the, um, the, there's code isolation as well as security isolation that modern SharePoint development doesn't fully solve yet but the add-in model does. You still require Visual Studio again, uh, Visual Studio uh, 2013 at least or above, um, and some other components. Something else that add-ins do allow that currently other modern SharePoint development does not allow is there is a, a store. There's a way to sell your add-ins within the Microsoft Store, and currently there's no other model available. Uh, there's no other solution that we can do where we have a built-in store by Microsoft in order to, um, to sell our product in a global marketplace and it can quickly and easily get installed. Uh, so usefulness is here. There are definitely still use cases, as I said, where if you want to isolate your code and you need to isolate the business logic from everything else that might be happening, even on a given page, add-in models do work really well. And again, there's that distribution model via the uh, online store built in. I've already talked about the, the, the two different models. Uh, I'm going to kind of to leave it here where You've got these, the, the SharePoint hosted add-ins and the provider hosted. SharePoint hosted being, again, no custom C-sharp code really. It's all stored uh, in the browser within SharePoint itself using more like JavaScript to communicate, um, but still can do some pretty cool stuff with how you would um, with how you create that. Like a SharePoint hosted add-in could be used for provisioning because you can use JavaScript basically to configure your SharePoint site uh, but when you click this add-in, you know, you say, I want to activate this add-in, it can then go ahead and set up lists and, and set up pages and web parts and workflows and all kinds of cool stuff just using JavaScript and, and CSOM so, or JSON. Um, and it, it works pretty well. And then provider hosted again, where you're taking the business logic and you're moving it outside of SharePoint, you're hosting it somewhere else. But that does require that extra stores somewhere else. So if we look at the traditional models, I say they're not dead yet. It, it, there's not, it, besides what I said on deprecation, it's not even that like yet nearby. We're definitely moving away from these models. Um, I would not like to build new code. I would rather you not build new code using these traditional models. Uh, but if you have to, okay. I would rather see you look to migrate uh, to modern development techniques or if you're migrating to the cloud or if you're migrating to say SharePoint 2016 or maybe 2019 next year, you might just want to migrate your code, but you should, because you need to focus on, on just updating out of Windows 10 or SharePoint 10, let's say 2010. Okay, focus on the migration, but then do look at how can you migrate your code, your custom solutions to use more modern development techniques. I, I think that you will, you'll have a better long-term um, uh, approach there. Whoops, hit the wrong button there. All right. So let's kind of sum this up uh, with a nice good, um, uh, nice good summary here. So if you are working with SharePoint, and hopefully soon I'll be able to add SharePoint 2019 to this to the slide here, 
With SharePoint 2016 on-prem, you do have basically the whole gambit of all the different options here. If you're on SharePoint 2013, same thing. Everything I talked about really is available. When you look at SharePoint Online, if you're migrating to SharePoint Online, what you don't have is full trust solutions and sandbox solutions with custom code. You do have add in the add a model with provider hosted. I, I put a little star there because I do want you to remember that the custom code component, any kind of C sharp code in the add in would have to be stored outside of SharePoint. So it'd have to be stored somewhere else in Azure again, or if you're in an on-prem environment, uh, well, on-prem doesn't, it's easy. Uh, in the cloud, you need to store it somewhere else. And it doesn't have to be in Azure, it could be in AWS, it could be uh, on your own, in your own on-prem environment using IS and all that, totally cool. So. Hope that really kind of gives you a good idea and answers those questions I'm still hearing, like what's possible and what's not, what's available and what's not. You can still do a lot of the same stuff that you did before, um, but there's a new way. There's the way, there's the, the place where I want you to go. There's the place where the web has already gone in general, the web development has gone in general, and that's where we want to get you. And that is something built around client-side applications. Uh, this is related to uh, something people also refer to as like single-page apps or spas. The same idea here where you've got all of your code being built uh, really in JavaScript and HTML, TypeScript, things like that. Your, your, all your major components uh, for the UI, for the user interface, happens at the client side in the browser. And you're building your solutions using an open source tool chain. So, Let's get away from Visual Studio uh, if we can. I mean, I just installed Visual Studio 2017 because I'm doing some Azure function development. And I think it was like 15 gigs or 12 gigs and it took a couple hours to install. I mean, that that's for for developers, I get it. But for web developers, for SharePoint developers, that that's a lot. I would much rather see us move to where the rest of the world is going in web development, which is towards an open source tool chain. Don't worry, I'm gonna explain what all this means. Okay, so first, client-side rendering, the first two, uh, the first of the two components I was just talking about. The idea of client-side rendering is using JavaScript or its derivative, something more like TypeScript, let's say, where you're building your application where all of the user interface components are all being rendered in the browser itself. So you aren't sending any kind of HTML to the from the server to the um, uh, to the to the to the client to the browser, all of that's happening within the um, within the browser itself using traditionally like JavaScript or TypeScript, which just transpiles into JavaScript. A lot of the business logic can still happen in the browser. Your JavaScript can manipulate data. Now it needs to get data, right? Then normally in traditional models we would we would do all that at once. We would we would get a request, we would go ahead and figure out all the data we needed, we would generate all the HTML and we would send it back to the browser and say, here, print this in this way. No, no, we don't want to do that. So the browser is going to have some JavaScript and it's going to say, hey, we now need some data in order to go do this. Great. We're going to use APIs or remote APIs to go get that data. We might use the SharePoint REST API, we might use the Microsoft Graph API, or we might use other external APIs that that are available out there. We want to interact with GitHub for things. We can use their uh, their APIs to interact with that data. Uh, we maybe want to use webhooks or something to subscribe to services in our development model to be able to, to interact with SharePoint. And then uh, the rendering would then occur in the browser itself because the browser got the data, traditionally, hopefully in JSON, because it's much easier to work with. And then using maybe some libraries to help, something like uh, React or maybe uh, Knockout or something, or again, like SharePoint Framework, which we'll get to in a second, would take the data and it would create the HTML necessary using a JavaScript uh, or, or React templating engine that will make just coding easier, but it will eventually produce HTML uh, and JavaScript that the browser can then render and create the beautiful interface that allows the user to interact with the data, which is ideal. So the server itself is just, it's getting requests, any kind of your, your the backend servers are getting requests, it's processing what it needs to do, and it's shooting back some sort of uh, response, very simple data only response, and then all the rendering occurs at the client side, all the HTML generation, and then the converting the HTML into a, a beautiful website all occurs at the browser. 
we can do this and we have been doing this since SharePoint 2010 even. And the way that we did this in SharePoint before was things like with the script editor web part or we, we customize the master page uh, to go ahead and, and just load up a bunch of JavaScript and manipulate the, the DOM, the document object model to do what we wanted. Maybe we're using JS link or something like that. So all of that was, was possible in classic SharePoint, but we want to move to a more holistic approach within modern SharePoint development so that we don't have to do those kind of hacky kind of things. We want to do it more natively. Where I want to sum up this idea is, is that we are taking the, the HTML rendering, the creation of the HTML necessary to make the page look the way you want. We're taking that from the server and we're giving it to the browser. The browser can do all that kind of work for us. And, Lots of reasons why I'm hoping you're kind of seeing some of the beauty of some of this already, um, but there's there's really good reasons why we would want to let the client do this kind of work rather than the uh, the browser itself. Okay, so to make this whole thing work, the kind of building blocks to go together um, to allow us to be able to, to do some of this new stuff, there's the whole build process and the tooling, the tool chain that we might need, which is some of the open source components I've talked about. And basically everything I'm showing here is is open source, meaning free, which is good. It's also, a lot of it at least, is pretty heavily battle tested. Uh, all the code is out there, so people are able to say, hey, that's not good code, and here's ways to improve it, uh, and they're able to make it. There are some downsides to that, uh, basically around a lot of versions. <laughs> Things keep getting updated, but that's probably a good thing as well. It's just something to manage. So on the build process, within the tooling itself, uh, we have things like Yeoman templates, which will give us a templating engine uh, to help us start our projects and to build our, our uh, applications when we're done with our code and we're ready to build it and make it actually do its thing. We have things like Gulp. And uh, when we want to pack things up and say, hey, we're ready to go, let's build a nice JavaScript package so we can send to the server. We're using things like System.js or Webpack. Uh, we've got new languages like TypeScript, which is um, uh, basically typed JavaScript for lack of a longer discussion of what that is all about. Uh, things like SAS is a programming language for CSS. Now, it is helpful to not have to just work with straight TypeScript or JavaScript. There's some good frameworks that can help accelerate our development process, things like React and Angular Knockout. Uh, what's cool is with SharePoint development, you can use anything. I mean, if you really like a different system or a different framework, maybe you're a Handlebars fan like I am. You could go ahead and say, hey, I'm just going to use a more simplistic templating engine JavaScript templating engine like Handlebars. And yeah, totally do that in modern development. Uh, there is no the solution. There's no the right way to do it. There are lots of really good ways. Uh, and we can have a whole hour's discussion on is React better than Angular, Angular better than React. Um, now, code editor. So I talked about how Visual Studio 2017, it took gigs and gigs of data and uh, of hard drive space and it took forever to install. Uh, especially for client-side development, that is ridiculous. So there are a lot of other code editors out there that are freely available and open source and much more lean. Uh, things like Visual Studio Code, Sublime, uh, Notepad++. I personally am a huge supporter of Visual Studio Code. Uh, I know a lot of other SharePoint developers have been moving there as well. It's clean. It's simple. It has a, a really good um, user interface. In my opinion, it's simple and works really well. Um, the searching components I like a lot, and the type ahead is stellar, especially for modern SharePoint development. So if you are um, you know, a Sublime user, if that's what you want, hey, I, I'm not going to judge you. They've got great packages as well. Notepad++, really good code editor. Uh, but using these kind of three buckets of things, the build process and tooling, the some sort of framework to help accelerate our development, and then also a good, simple, clean code editor is our building uh, building blocks for building our new modern solutions on top of on top of SharePoint. Now, if we want to kind of look at classic development, which uh, I'm assuming a lot of you have had experience more with classic SharePoint development, so this should be uh, sort of makes sense. You know, we had IIS and .NET was uh, where we were storing everything and building our code base. Uh, we had NuGet, which would go and grab the extra packages we would need. MS Build would build our solution in the language typically that we use with C Sharp. Uh, and then when we wanted to create, say, a new SharePoint uh, web part, we would then go into the project templates and say, hey, Visual Studio, I would like to create a web part, and it would build it for us. In the open source tool chain, we have these new tools I've been talking about, where we're going to use Node as our backend process to help host our development environment on our local machine while we're developing it. And it will be the backend engine that will help uh, build our building process, um, as well as our packaging retrieval. 
in order to go get additional modules or packages we may need, we're going to be using uh, NPM. When we're ready to build a solution and we're saying, hey, okay, let's go ahead and, and do some tasks and uh, go ahead and create um, and package everything together, we're going to use something like Gulp. The language of choice right now for modern development, especially in SharePoint framework, which we'll talk about next, is TypeScript, which, as I said, is a kind of like a JavaScript derivative. Uh, but we still have a template in Engine as well, which is nice. So we don't have to start from 100% scratch. We can use something called a Yeoman, a Yeoman template to say, hey, go build a scaffold project uh, for, um, for the SharePoint solution that we're going to be building. The next building blocks we might need now that we've got the kind of a front end component and we don't have to use the Microsoft way that they're recommending, which is SharePoint framework. We can still use some of our classic techniques, um, but we still need to go get our data. Uh, and often we're working with SharePoint, so we're gonna want SharePoint data. Uh, a great building block there is the SharePoint REST API. Uh, which is a RESTful service, go figure, REST API is a RESTful service, that allows us to work with SharePoint using simple uh, HTTP requests. So we can get data from SharePoint, we can update data from SharePoint, we can delete uh, uh, data, add it, et cetera, uh, edit, which is, which is really useful and helpful. So we're able to create like a simple request uh, and then push it into SharePoint and SharePoint's gonna do what we ask, assuming the, the request is correct. Uh, and of course we have, um, uh, we have access to do it. Uh, the REST API is really similar to the client side object model. Then there's the, the JavaScript uh, object model, which I have found for sure that the SharePoint REST API is far easier to use and say the client side object model. The catch to that is that the CSOM is more powerful still just a little bit, uh, but the REST API is definitely catching up. One of the things that uh, I would recommend, and I add this line of code here in blue, uh, is because the share the SharePoint rest API natively will return uh, XML when you ask it to do something and I found that to be uh, not useful especially in client-side development so you can tell SharePoint rest API hey give me back JSON really easy by adding a header adding a header to your request saying that you would like the uh, content type set to application JSON basically saying I would like JSON back and I add that oh data verbose you don't need that that's saying hey SharePoint on the response you give me, uh, give me the robust data, give me everything that uh, I may be wanting. Not always good in production because uh, you might get too much data back and if you had you know, 100,000 clients all accessing the same data, you might be sending a lot of data across the wire that you don't need. But getting JSON back is definitely important. Some 0.001% examples here of what you can do, uh, but just so you show, like you could say, hey, if I would like to go get uh, a specific list, maybe the site pages list. I can just send a request, get a get request. You could basically do this in the browser uh, that says, go ahead and um, based on my tenant, this is SharePoint online, based on my tenant uh, dot SharePoint dot com slash sites. Maybe I had a, a demo group site. I can go to the API, which is the REST API, go, go to the list, get by title, site pages. There you go. It will now return to you uh, that specific list in a nice JSON uh, format. But maybe you want like just specific data, like I just want the I just want the title of the list. You can do that as well, uh, and you can start to provide query string variables to go grab and get more data. Now, again, there is so much stuff here. Great way to get started. Just Google SharePoint REST API. You're going to get eventually pretty quickly dumped to uh, docs.microsoft.com uh, slash SharePoint, and you'll find a whole bunch of information on how to really use the SharePoint REST API. But the SharePoint REST API allows us to work with our SharePoint data in the browser. So we don't have to build custom code and say a full trust solution to go interact with SharePoint. Now in Office 365, you may want to go one step further where you want uh, not just data out of SharePoint, but data out of the Microsoft Graph. No worries, Microsoft Graph is there to help you. And very similar to you know, the SharePoint REST API, there is a, graph, a Microsoft Graph API. The Long-term promise of the Graph API is that the one API to rule them all. Basically, just one API that can get you any data out of your Office 365 tenant. Uh, we're getting there, I suppose. The SharePoint REST API still gives you a lot more control of SharePoint, but Share there are SharePoint components in the Graph API. Um, it is Office 365 only, so it's not going to on-prem uh, at all. I can't see how it would. Um, just something else to be aware of. Something else that I do always like to point out is that you, in order for a 
to get a connection to the Graft API, you do need to have an Azure Active Directory um, app ID and secret. So basically in Office 365, you need to go to Azure a, um, AAD and you need to register an application and then you give that application permissions to say, hey, based on this, uh, this, this app ID, I would like to be able to allow certain interactions. I wanna be able to allow uh, read access to SharePoint and to groups but I don't want you to, I don't want anybody to be able to use this app ID to be able to post data, to push data into sites or groups or whatever, uh, which is, it's good and bad. It, it's good because you can greatly limit who can do what with any given, um, any given app ID, especially say if it got hacked or if someone were gonna be malicious. The catch to all of that is uh, interacting with the Graft API can be difficult to get the token, which we'll get to in a second here. Very simple though to get a uh, to get your data uh, in and out of of Graph once you get what's called this token, which we'll get to shortly. Basically, what you're looking at is graph.microsoft.com, uh, your version, which really there's v1.0 or, or beta, uh, and then the specific resource you want, uh, and then you can again you can add some query parameters to help refine it. Lots and lots and lots of documentation available here. Um, it is not to me as easy as the REST API to interact with. Uh, in more classic development scenarios. There has been some really cool announcements in the last couple of weeks around SharePoint Framework that does make interacting with Graft API significantly easier using SharePoint Framework, which is beyond the scope of this particular discussion, um, but there is some information which I'll, I'll, I'll try to get to and, and point you to uh, in just a little bit. The issue with Graph that I have and what this kind of new announcement on SharePoint Framework uh, is so exciting is that in order to interact with the Graph API, you need to go through um, OAuth 2.0. You need to go through OAuth. You need to go get a token. And that process can be challenging in a browser. It basically requires you to, to log in and oftentimes even consent to say, yes, I, I'm allowing this action to occur in the browser, even after you've created the app and you've created your code. Now, I'm sure a lot of you have seen this, or maybe some of you have seen this, like when you do a, a Facebook login or a, a, a Twitter login at another service, and you're like, hey, I'd like to log in here via using Twitter. Uh, you would go and you'd get redirected to to Twitter. You'd log in there and you'd say, and they would say, hey, this other service is, is asking for permission. Are you okay with this? And you say, yes, I'm okay with it. That is using basically the same protocol. The catch in SharePoint, in my opinion, is let's say you're building a portal, uh, an internet portal, let's say, and you want to go get to Graph. You want to go get maybe um, someone's tasks out of Graph. In order for that to occur, you need to go get a token for that user to be able to interact with Graph. And it can require some redirecting while that permission is in fact validated. And that's less than ideal. Now, SharePoint Framework again takes care of it, which is really cool stuff. But anyhow, once you get OAuth too, you now have access to Graph, which is cool. And you can get to users, groups, and mail and calendars. And this is stuff that our clients have, have been uh, really happy to see in their portals because it gives them more data from, their, from a specific user's Office 365 experience all within say a, a, a single point of entry, which is really nice. So I definitely don't want you to shy away from the graph because of the authentication issue. It's just something I want you to think about um, as you move forward and maybe you can look to then use more these more modern techniques to help move forward. Okay. Hey, so, Eric, we, uh, hey Eric, real yeah. quick, we had a question come in. Um, what about hybrid environments with the graph API? Any idea of how that will work? Kind of talked about it a little bit, but if you wanted to expand on that. Okay, so uh, I'm going to break apart the uh, ooh deconstruct. I want to use that word to kind of deconstruct what we're trying to potentially trying to say here. In a hybrid environment, the way I'm well, it's pretty obvious. So you you would have an on-prem experience and you would have an Office 365 experience. Anything that can get pushed into your into the Office 365 tenant should be crawled properly by the Graph API. Okay, so uh, if you're pushing your SharePoint data into um, SharePoint Online or you're pushing it into Office 365 tenant through some syncing methodologies, Graph should then be able to manipulate with manipulate it. So now you can at least get the data. Okay, next. Now you want potentially from an on-prem experience, you want to be able to get that Graph data. Uh, not, that should not actually technically be an issue because as long as we can get past the OAuth 2 issue, you just need to get a token. You don't need to be in Office 365 or on a SharePoint online site to be able to interact with Graph. You just need to be able to get that, that token. Uh, 
the ideal way here would be through single sign-on, you're, you're syncing up your either Active Directory with your Azure Active Directory or vice versa. You, you're, you're using maybe only AAD for all your authentication and then you're having your on-prem environment really use that for your authentication. So when I log in as uh, the, my, my local domain account, Eric Overfield, let's say, when I then go to my on-prem SharePoint environment, the account that I'm logged in at uh, is already synced into Azure Active Directory. So when the graph component is needed and that OAuth occurs, I've, I've technically kind of already logged in and uh, graph would already see that. Uh, the OAuth authentication would already really see that. So it's possible. It's going to be more complex and it's going to require you, in my opinion, to um, make sure you sync up your accounts properly for the uh, single sign-on. You shouldn't have to even do that, though. I mean, Graph can be separate. Graph API can be consumed, supposed to be consumed anywhere. The problem is the authentication. It just may require someone to log in using another account, which is a, a questionable user experience. So it'd be something I would be cautioned about on the UI side. Hey, Eric, we got one more question that came in that might uh, kind of piggyback on that. Will REST API via SharePoint eventually be deprecated in favor of Graph REST API? Ooh. Uh, I like Fun that. Question. And I have an answer yet. I, eventually, yes. I may, no, that's, let me rephrase that. Eventually, sure could be. In the near future, no. <laughs> no, 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 no. There, there's no... Uh, I've heard not one inkling of a rumor of that. It's, I, I, in fact, I'd go the other way. I think there's more investment in the REST API right now, the SharePoint REST API. Uh, but it sure could. I just would argue that any portal you built today is going to have the REST API before you retire, <laughs> until you retire, most anyone on this call. I, I just can't see it going away anytime soon. But I, I haven't heard. I, I would be I would be shocked, like really, really, really shocked that that <laughs> got deprecated next decade. This is me coming out of the blue. Like, I'm just telling you my opinion. I can't see it going away in eight to 10 years. Nice. Great questions, guys. Keep them on coming. Oh, and then Will, who asked that question, says he likes that answer. Thanks. Oh, so, great. Excellent job, Eric. <laughs> Do what I can. Okay, so let's keep building some more building blocks for modern development. Uh, the next component is Office UI Fabric. And some of you, I believe, have been on um, one of the webinars where we went over this a couple months ago. So I'll just kind of be quick here. Office UI Fabric is a mostly open source, really is open source um, um, uh, project uh, run by Microsoft to help build the user interface, the front end experiences on top of Office 365, in particular in our case, SharePoint. Um, SharePoint and OneDrive in particular are using most of UI Fabric to create that front end. So when you go to uh, Microsoft or Share, uh, your tenant .microsoft SharePoint com, and you go to your like root portal and you're looking at the SharePoint online experience, that, that UI that you're seeing is built using UI Fabric and that's available to you. Uh, what the good thing about UI Fabric is that it allows you to focus on the functionality of any of your customizations and, and worry less about the user interface because you can just basically piggyback on top of the user interface that SharePoint provides you. Uh, the other ideal here is, is that your customizations should really look like SharePoint. They should look like they belong. So it would be better if your customizations use the same panels, the same dialogues, the same topography, the same color palette, uh, the same theming ability, and UI Fabric allows you to do that. So I'm going to leave it at that, but it's definitely a good building block that's available. It's a whole hour discussion on what UI Fabric can do. And some more tools that we have available to us, things that you might use in your uh, in your modern tool chain to move forward with uh, to move forward with SharePoint. These are primarily SharePoint Online, I readily admit. Um, if you want to be notified when events have occurred, uh, we have SharePoint webhooks to do that, which is a, a notification system to say, hey, when a list item is added, let me know. Uh, this is asynchronous, uh, or, uh, meaning it, it's built around uh, <laughs> id events, happened events, things that have occurred, not things that are occurring. So if you want to know when something has occurred, uh, webhooks might be a good uh, use case for you there. They are, uh, they work, they're reliable. They, there's some challenges to decoding them in my opinion. They're, it's not necessarily as simple as you may think. It's not that you're gonna get notified necessarily that uh, an event occurred and that you then instantly know what the event happened. It's rather you'll be told an event occurred and for security reasons actually, you then have to go find out what did occur. Um, and there's some time stamping issues you need to consider. So 
webhooks really work. They just um, they are a little different than we've used before when we wanted to know when, when we, we wanted to know an event occurred. Uh, Azure Functions, I, I'm a big fan of right now. Uh, these are containerized uh, microservices that you can, re can create within Azure. Really cool. These are serverless architecture. Uh, it's based around service, serverless architecture, meaning you can spin up some custom functionality that has a get post, uh, basically like your own REST endpoint, just a, an endpoint, uh, a web endpoint that can then do some really cool stuff. Uh, custom isolated C sharp code, TypeScript code, JavaScript code, PowerShell code. Uh, you can spin that up in, in minutes, uh, all in Azure, and you are built on um, processing computing. Uh, so you can be have you can have like micro micro penny charges on just when you need a specific service you built. Uh, you just get charged for that. So really cool stuff. But at the same time, you can use Azure to build full on web apps. So if you need to build some really big cool app, no problem. You got Azure there to help you with that. If you don't want to do it uh, on on prem, at least um, Azure apps in a sense are kind of like. To me, that if you needed to build some of that full trust solution kind of stuff, you could build it on-prem using your own uh, Windows environment, Windows Server environment, or Linux environment, or Node environment, whatever you want. Um, Azure Apps can provide you a lot of that same stuff, but you don't have to worry about all of the infrastructure. The infrastructure is there. It can scale as much as you want it to, uh, and you've got a lot of pricing options there. So more tools available to us uh, in the modern tool chain. But let's look at Microsoft's way, the way they really want to take Everything I just talked about, how they would like you to do it, what, what's their idea. And, and the tool, the major tool they've provided to us is the SharePoint framework, which I'm sure a lot of you have heard about. Um, for those of you who have, or maybe not, or it's kind of new to you, the idea here is building a client-side rendering-based JavaScript framework, although we're going to use TypeScript to, um, as our programming language, to build those custom modern experiences on top of, of uh, SharePoint so that we can utilize these these newer ideas, this newer tool, this newer tool chain, this newer um, uh, this newer newer tool belt prepackaged for us, sort of like ready to go, already sort of pre-built. So we've got like our, our modern experiences on SharePoint, but it is still backwards compatible. SharePoint 2016 uh, does allow for SharePoint framework based web parts. Uh, we've got our front end experiences. The SharePoint framework is our web parts uh, in SharePoint uh, 2016 on SharePoint Online. We also have something called extensions, which we'll get to. Uh, and then through the SharePoint framework and those custom controls we built, we can now interact with external data. We can work with um, uh, graph. We can work with other uh, line of business applications, et cetera. But the, the, the architecture is sort of set for us, which is helpful. They've already built us a tool chain uh, with a template where we can say, I'd like to build a new web part. And within minutes, we would have a Hello World web part that we can then build out and do all of our cool stuff uh, with some more examples, which we'll get to in a second. So if we take the SharePoint framework, we take a lot of the toolboxes, the, the tools that I, I've been talking about. What this does is it, it reinvigorates SharePoint as a true enterprise um, development platform, something that we can develop enterprise applications on top of beyond what's available just out of the box, which is good. Now, out of the box, SharePoint Online in particular is really powerful and it is getting a lot better. They're making a lot of changes. We're getting a lot of new out of the box web parts. We're getting new components, things like uh, hub sites. So this is taking place uh, at the end of February, 2018. And this morning, just not a couple hours ago, uh, there was a, a, a PNP community call um, where they, they reviewed for the public to see, they reviewed hub sites, and hub sites are are supposed to ship in uh, uh, at least a, um, a targeted release by the uh, end of next month, the end of March of 2018. Now uh, that's now public knowledge because it was set on a public call. So really cool things are happening. We don't have to wait every three years, um, but we can take what Microsoft has provided and we can build on top of it yet again, and it is being fully supported. The things we care about most are things like user experience and, and whoops, uh, user experience and, and getting to the data that we need, working on some long-term processes and whatnot, but then also be able to package all this stuff up uh, to delivery to our own tenant, but as well as for us developers who are, are developing products for the industry in, in general, it'd be nice if we were able to package this up and even have a store available to us. So things like on the user experience side, um, our custom web parts that we might need and uh, things like Power Apps would sure be nice. Our data APIs, uh, being able to access SharePoint and, and JSON, CSOM and 
the files API is processing things like flow and workflows and, and being able to have remote event receivers occur. So we know when something has occurred, we can deal with it. Um, and then have a, a component to be able to have some sort of store or as well as solutions that, that we can more easily install within the SharePoint. And if we look at Microsoft's way of dealing with this today, We've got the SharePoint framework to help with those user experiences. For the data, the data and APIs, we have graph APIs as well as the SharePoint REST API to get to the data that we need. Uh, for processes, we have things like webhooks, Flow, uh, and Microsoft Flow to help us uh, react to events when they occur and to help cause a chain of reactions to occur. So like InfoPath, although still around for many more years, Microsoft says, we've got some replacements that are definitely maturing uh, to, to help us with those uh, very important processes within within SharePoint. Um, and then using the SharePoint framework, we can build these solutions and using um, PNP, which is a whole nother discussion, we can help package up our solutions for redeployment. We can have, there's uh, Microsoft has released some uh, ALM APIs now to be able to work with and deploy and manage our SharePoint framework solutions uh, in a longer term strategy. So we aren't just building one solution and helping it work forever. There's a strategy in place to be able to interact with that solution and to update it as needed or to redeploy it or to, to manage it across uh, our entire tenant. So definitely SharePoint, SharePoint Align in particular for me is still a very valid development platform for us to build solutions that we need for our organization or for our clients or for whoever ever it is that we're working with. Out-of-the-box experience, good, but we can still improve upon that and make it even better, which I really love. Okay, so now if we extend this just a little bit, um, there are some tool sets available to us that takes everything I talked about and helps us even more get the information we need to, to build this forward uh, in, in modern development. And that's primarily built around this uh, the this new ecosystem. It's not new, it's been around for a couple of years now. It's gone through some name changes. Uh, it's currently most uh, often referred to as SharePoint PNP, although it's even grown past that. It's now more to me the SharePoint dev ecosystem in general. And this is a community driven project that is still, it is maintained and managed by Microsoft. I mean, they're heavily involved and they definitely do do run the thing, but it is has a huge uh, community involvement as well. And th this is just uh, amazing. I'm interacting with these people at least once a week through uh, all of the different uh, interactions that they offer to us, including community calls like the one that, that I was on this morning that's open to everybody. But even better, uh, the SharePoint PMP initiative, not only being open source, it gives you all sorts of code and samples and guidance and best practices and the documentation now coming out of Microsoft over at docs.microsoft.com slash SharePoint. That's mainly being driven by a lot of the, the PMP community because docs.microsoft.com, one of the reasons why they went to that new platform for documentation in general was because it is driven by GitHub. Or it's driven by Git, really. So what I mean by that is the documentation for Microsoft has, at least in the SharePoint world for sure, has been opened up to the community. And what I like about this is if you don't like the documentation or you found something better, you can actually make a PR or a pull request and say, hey, here's how I'd like to make this better. Like, this is good. But we as end users can be uh, uh, confident that those submissions are reviewed. Just because I make a submission to docs.microsoft.com doesn't mean it's going to get accepted. If it's accepted, you know that like Microsoft's SharePoint engineers looked at what I said and said, yeah, that's important. That's good. Yes, it's available to the public. And that's all, a lot of it is being driven by SharePoint PMP. If this is new to you, uh, you, you need to go there now. So github.com slash SharePoint slash PMP is a pretty good starting point. Uh, or just Google SharePoint PMP, SharePoint products and practices. It can be a little intimidating at first because you're like, wait, there's really there's not much here. It, it looks sort of empty. But if you start drilling into the code that they provided, the samples they provided, you'll realize there are uh, multiple hundreds, if not thousands of nuggets of information in code and samples and documentation and guidance and how to do most anything in SharePoint. I've found there's really good nuggets within this PNP initiative. Uh, and these community calls they have basically every week is a way that you can interact with uh, other SharePoint experts, the leading experts in the world, uh, including Microsoft engineers, and ask them direct questions like, hey, have you thought of this? Or are you doing that? Or when is the latest thing coming out? The latest information is coming from PNP. I mean, today when they said, hey, well, hubs are going to ship next month, 
uh, hub size will ship it in March 2018, at least a target released. I mean, huge. Like, if you want to stay on the bleeding edge, PNP is the way to go. Okay, <clears throat> no discussion here would be complete without talking about modern SharePoint. Like, what can we customize in modern SharePoint? So let me spend a few minutes on that in general. Uh, where we're at here, when I talk about modern SharePoint, and I believe most people uh, that I know, of, when we say modern SharePoint experiences or modern SharePoint, what we're referring to, referring to here are, are modern team sites. So these are those group-enabled team sites uh, that do not look like classic team sites, your old traditional SharePoint 2013, 2016 team sites, communication sites, soon to be hub sites, as well as modern lists and libraries. So the modern, the new list and library experience available really in SharePoint Online, that's a part of this new modern SharePoint experience. So that's what we're talking about. On the customization side, no master pages ever. Like, nope, that's gone. So take that out of your whole thinking. We will no longer have a master page and we're not getting that back. Probably uh, ever. I, I just, I can't, I, I, we're gonna get a whole new model of SharePoint development before we get something like uh, master pages back. We currently have no custom page layouts, uh, no way to truly create a, a new page that has a new page layout where we can customize that. Uh, we're not allowed to have custom CSS for the overall experience. We can have CSS for web parts, uh, for our SharePoint framework web parts and stuff, but not global CSS to manipulate the entire SharePoint. That's not fully true. You can hack that. And that's why I with JavaScript, I put a little star. You can't do JavaScript embed uh, where you've got JavaScript manipulating the whole page for reals. You can do it though, you're just hacking it. Uh, and that's where we'll get to in SharePoint framework extensions. They allow us to kind of get that stuff in, but it is definitely not supported and is not best practices. So with modern experiences, the primary way we're going to be able to manipulate a modern experience is with uh, the SharePoint framework. Uh, those are the SharePoint framework web parts where we can create components that we can put on the page. And those we have control of. Like that, we can control the UI. We can control what they do. Uh, and they're very well supported in that. Microsoft is fully behind that. So uh, totally would work just fine. That's available in SharePoint 2016. Should be available in 2019. No problem. Uh, and of course, is, is available on SharePoint Online. Okay, now available to SharePoint Online, not to on-prem yet, is extensions. So extensions are uh, not necessarily components. Uh, there's two major types of extensions. There's, there's an extension type, it's an application customizer that allows us to add a header. We can add a header to the top of our SharePoint pages. We can add a footer if we wanted something at the bottom. We can actually add general JavaScript. And this is where if you wanted to embed JavaScript to SharePoint in modern SharePoint, you can. It's just you that that share that JavaScript should not be manipulating the overall DOM. It should not be tweaking the SharePoint user experience outside of a header and footer because you're gonna have to link into the DOM using some sort of ID or class or something, and I can guarantee you that stuff's gonna change. You're gonna hurt yourself. So you can do it, but I certainly would not. Uh, SharePoint framework extensions also allow us to manipulate modern lists and libraries using field customizers and command sets, uh, which are pretty cool. So they allow us to manipulate a, uh, a list view or a, a, a library view which is pretty powerful stuff actually. So really cool stuff. Uh, you know, I didn't include in here, we have column customizers now, ways that we can manipulate columns uh, in a non-deployed way. We don't have to build a solution to SharePoint framework, uh, which, is, which is pretty cool. We can also manipulate the user interface using modern theming. Now actually you can use your classic themes as well. Uh, or modern things. There's a newer modern theming engine that's available. Uh, you can only use one or the other on a given site. You can't try to apply two themes at once. Uh, as far as I've, my testing and my team's testing, we have not been able to do that. So you can change the color palette uh, and it works okay. And it's getting better and there's some new tool sets being uh, created to do all that. Uh, we can build site designs now. That is, that's that's out, that should be going GA soon. But we can build a, a templated site experience for modern team sites and modern communication sites, which can help define things like lists and libraries and uh, content types and site columns and things like that. What is cool is a site design can also be uh, can also trigger a flow, so it can do something else. So what this means is, if someone with a site design, you create a custom site design, someone goes to the SharePoint homepage within uh, within SharePoint Online, they click on New Site, they then say they'd like to create a team site. There's now a dropdown that would be available if you have a site design targeted towards team sites 
modern team sites, and they can pick your team site, your team site template, shall we say, your team site site design. And when they activate that, your customizations can occur on top of uh, on top of the the out of the box modern team site experience. Same with communication sites. So really powerful there. The other way to manipulate the modern experiences, and this isn't just targeted towards modern, it's classic as well, is using uh, the PNP initiative. They offer something that's called PNP PowerShell. You can also use this in code as well. But you can use PNP provisioning. It's very similar to site designs, but it's not not quite the same. Uh, where you can create custom uh, provisioning templates that that allow you to say when a site is provisioned, go ahead and do all of this other stuff, such as create new content pages. And when you create a new content page, I wanted to have this kind of these sections and these rows and and these columns within those rows. And I would like web parts pre uh, predefined for you. Kind of think page layouty, but it's just a kind of more of a one time thing. It's like I'm going to provision this site and it's going to have these pages with these layouts but you can't then have a new page that has a new layout uh, that's predefined to have three sections and seven rows and these columns with these web parts pre-applied. That's not available yet. I, I don't even know it's gonna be available. I sure hope it is, um, I, I, but I can't tell you if it's on the roadmap or not because I really don't know. So there are definitely ways that we can customize modern SharePoint that are totally valid and totally available. So before we kind of wrap this up with a uh, with sort of Microsoft's roadmap, uh, I wanted to talk quickly about um, which direction would be right for you if you want to go with modern or classic. Uh, this could be a three hour discussion, but I'll try to keep it really, really quick here. Uh, if you when you are looking to develop on top of SharePoint, especially on SharePoint Online, my recommendation for you is start with. I want to do this in modern SharePoint using modern team sites, communication sites, hub sites. Uh, using PNP provisioning, using SharePoint framework only, uh, and I want to do it the Microsoft way. Start with that in your head. That should be your basis. If you're on-prem, it's almost kind of similar. Like if I'm on 2016, 2013, you got to go classic, so it doesn't count. 2016, how can I do this using the most modern techniques possible, using SharePoint framework for my web parts? But let's stick with kind of SharePoint Online because that's where we get more modern. Uh, start with that first and then start chipping away if you find a use case that doesn't allow you to uh, to be modern. So let's just take an example of our decision makers are requiring us to have a custom portal design. We are an uh, organization and we have a strong identity and we must have a custom looked, looking site. Okay, then you should probably use a publishing portal for on SharePoint Online. Totally valid, totally supported not been deprecated in any way. And, and you can find recommendations from Microsoft saying, yep, we get it. There are certain workloads that classic experiences would need. Okay, so use a publishing portal for the portal, but do all your customizations using a out of the box master page. Don't touch the master page. Maybe use JavaScript embed if you have to, to manipulate some things. Maybe use alternative CSS, I get that, that's okay. All of your components though, SharePoint framework web parts. SharePoint Framework Web Parts work in classic experiences. So why not set yourself up for the future? But maybe you're like, nope, we can't do it for whatever reason. I, I can't come up with one right now, but if you could, then you say, okay, well, we're gonna have to use just JavaScript. We're not gonna, we're gonna use just a script editor web part for this piece. Okay, I get that. Uh, you know, there, there are use cases where you must go you must go classic and, and that's okay. I would just say in general, start with modern, chip away as you need to. When you're with your customizations, try to do it all in SharePoint framework. And if you can't, then look at other techniques such as JavaScript embed or a custom classic SharePoint uh, web part. If you follow that path, I, I think you'll you'll protect yourself better. And there's a long discussion, as I said, uh, there is some good documentation that's slowly being written around this, but it's also new. Uh, a lot of us don't, you know, we haven't, we just, we don't know yet. Uh, even Microsoft, I argue, doesn't, fully know, like hub sites are just coming out now, but people are talking about, hey, we want to be able to embed hub sites within hub sites. Yeah, that makes sense. You, you Organizations have hierarchies. That's not available right now. So Microsoft is figuring that out and like, where does a portal fit in and what if I have to customize it? So much. Okay, just a few slides left, a few pieces I want to talk about. Uh, let's look at kind of where we've been with uh, SharePoint um, over the last year. A lot has been released, if you think about it. I know it's been slow in a lot of things and the trickle can get a little frustrating and you don't always know when Microsoft's gonna release something, I get it. 
but also a lot has been a lot has been created and we've got some things coming soon but if you look at like all the stuff we've gotten we've gotten webhooks we've gotten framework we've gotten uh sharepoint sites are now in graph uh all the way up to sharepoint framework web parts are on prem they're available in sharepoint 2016. this is some pretty cool stuff and coming real soon uh by soon we're talking like in the next month or two here march april 2018 is a, a, where we look to be happening uh, extended graph access from sharepoint framework going ga now this i didn't talk about but only a few weeks ago uh, the latest version of SharePoint Framework, I think it's 1.4.1, was just released. And that allows us to basically create any call we want to the Graft API requesting any access we might need in the development cycle. Then when the SharePoint Framework web part gets deployed into the tenant, the tenant admin has said, hey, the solution you just asked for that you're installing, it's requiring access to the Graft. Are you going to allow that? And you can then say, yeah, okay, I trust this web part, we build it, yes, we want that access, which is really cool. But the OAuth component for you, that token creation I talked about before, is handled for us. Awesome. Like, I'm really excited about this, I can't wait till this goes GA because it will solve so many hassles communicating with the, share, uh, with the Graft API, at least in the cloud. Uh, I don't know about on-prem on that one. Uh, site designs going GA, so those were released uh, to first release tenants or uh, target release. They keep naming that stuff on me uh, just recently. Uh, and then hub sites, as I talked about, should be coming to target release sometime in the next month or so, around the March 2018 timeframe, along with some management tools, uh, the SharePoint Online Management PowerShell, uh, the SharePoint Online PowerShell management uh, commandlets for hub management uh, should get released at the same time. Actually, they already are released. The latest version of the SPO commandlets already has it. It's just not available in the tenant yet. So can't wait till that stuff is released. So really cool stuff on the uh, on the horizon for us developers. No reason to not be planning for this now and to be developing our solutions now feeling pretty safe. So my general recommendations here, uh, I know we're running out of time, so I'm gonna, whoops. That was not what I wanted, so let me go back. There we go. If you haven't already, you need to move to client-side rendering as soon as possible. Basically, you need to take your rendering, put it onto the client, and all the uh, back-end processes, your business processes, those need to go out of SharePoint, Azure, IIS, somewhere else, another API. That's kind of a biggie. Uh, it's time to move to the open source tool chain. You need to get familiar with Node. You need to get familiar with NPM. You should get familiar with Gulp at least. You should get familiar with the SharePoint framework uh, and, and use this open source tooling. I know us classic Visual Studio developers, like we don't like that. We just liked hitting F5 and it just worked in this good GUI. We're moving to the command line. It's a good move for you. Do it. Uh, I did it a couple years ago and I've been very happy with it. It just, it, it gives you so much more control and just not having to hit F5 is not that big a deal. Like in the command line, it's pretty easy. Gulp serve and you get things built for you. It, it's, I think it's a lot better. And I, I think once you get into it, you will definitely like it. Uh, and then the last one is the idea around your customization should all be in SharePoint framework if you're on 2016 and above, uh, SharePoint online, et cetera. I don't want to see you building script editor web part stuffs anymore, except if you're classic on-prem, um, move to these new technologies and that will make your life easier if you as you upgrade into uh, modern versions of SharePoint. So uh, with that, I've got some resources for you and then I wanna spend just a, one more minute after that. Uh, an easy way to download, uh, it, to get this list is to actually download the, the slide deck. So what I'm gonna do at the end, I know that Michael's got some few closing words. I'm gonna actually uh, go all the way back up to the top of my uh, my slide deck because on the title slide, I did have the um, a URL that you can use to download the slide deck. Uh, but before I go, what I wanted to say is, hey, uh, if, you're, if you're listening to this live or you're listening to this uh, at the end of February or March, I, I hope you can join me at some conferences I'm, coming, I'm going to be going to. Uh, the North American uh, Collaboration Summit is happening uh, just next week, basically, March 2nd and 3rd uh, in Branson, Missouri. A whole bunch of us are going to be there. Um, really great opportunity, very inexpensive. Uh, if you're in the Midwest, for sure, this is a great conference to go to. What's pretty cool about this is that the next week, uh, a bunch of the uh, uh, MVPs are gathering in Redmond for a conference. And so we've got a lot of Europeans coming to uh, Branson as well. So it's a great opportunity to meet some of the local experts. Uh, as well as to just get great, great training at a really good price. 
The other one I really want to highlight is the SharePoint Conference North America. Uh, basically, we can look at it. SharePoint Conference is back, uh, mostly. It's pretty exciting, pretty cool. Over the last couple of years, there's always been this May event, not always, but there's been this May event with um, Microsoft and SharePoint where they've made some, some major mid-year mid announcements. That is being moved to SharePoint Conference. Um, so it's happening May 21st to 23rd in Las Vegas. The pricing is pretty reasonable. Uh, if you use the um, the code Overfield, just remember my name, you'll save yourself 50 bucks for more reasons to be there. This is a SharePoint Office 365 uh, tool uh, tool set with a little bit of Azure, but Microsoft, a SharePoint specific conference for you. It's billing to be the largest SharePoint focused conference in the world. Uh, thousands of people are expected. Um, I highly recommend you be there. I would go so far as to say if you had to choose between SharePoint, uh, SBC and Ignite, I would choose SBC if I'm in the SharePoint world. If you were in a larger world, you needed more stuff, then sure, I get Ignite would be good. But I'm telling you, this will be a great conference. You won't have to walk 15 minutes to go to every session, and the material is going to be stellar. Microsoft is making huge, huge, huge investments. So with that, I really appreciate everyone's time. I hope you had, you hope you learned a few things. I'm going to switch this back over to Michael, but in the meantime, I'm going to go back all the way up to the beginning of my slide deck so you can get the URL in case you want to download this. So thank you again, and Michael, if you're there, go ahead and take it away. I'm back. I, I promise I didn't go anywhere during the middle of that. Uh, everyone, thank you so much for uh, for joining us here. Eric, thank you so much for all that information. That was just some great stuff. Uh, a, a whole slew of questions came in toward the end there, and I didn't want to interrupt you uh, while you were on a roll. So uh, I'm going to go through a couple of these real quick. Um, I know it's your favorite part of the of the whole thing, Eric. So uh, let's Q&A away, shall we? Uh, first is... First is you mentioned the hub sites. Uh, you mentioned that hub sites started to be released next month. I've heard that they will only be one level deep. Can you confirm or yes. deny this? That's what they said today. Yeah. Um, gotcha. And you may, you may have said that earlier, but I just wanted to reiterate the question. No, no, absolutely. Yeah. So that one's a uh, 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 one level deep as of now. Yes. So basically, you can have you cannot nest a hub site within a hub site. Uh, people asked for it, and I think they. The response I heard from Vesa Yuvenin, who is at Microsoft Engineering, who runs the call, I, I my recollection is they said, yeah, okay, well, I mean, we're thinking about it. We hear you. But there's no current plan on that. Gotcha. And then kind of a follow-up to that. Also, what is there with personalizing data, like with Delve? Is there is this personalization being included in either Graph or Delve or anything else in PNP or uh, SharePoint framework? So you want to help create a personalized site. So when I go to a certain site, it should be more personalized to me. That's kind of how I'm reading it. I think so, yeah. Well, That's let's just, kinda... I can answer that question. Uh, natively, like, no... But you can do that. Like SharePoint framework web parts, could, you could personalize them. You can get the user, and then based on the user, you can get more information who they are in your coding, and then you can customize that experience, that particular web part. But if you wanted to like relay out the whole page, uh, that would you you can you could do anything. Still, you just are going to hurt yourself. So that's something that I don't believe is heavily supported within uh, modern experiences, and I don't. I haven't heard anything about that kind of level of personalization uh, coming anytime soon. But you can build web parts that could, in a sense, hide or disappear, or hide or show themselves, dependent upon the user, like maybe not make themselves available. Or you can have a, a web part or extension that said, oh, you're an, you're an owner? Then you get a new experience. Um, but it's not quite the same as the audience targeting that we saw in classic uh, development. Yeah, uh, he made uh, our person who asked this question, uh, Joe. Thank you, Joe, for asking these great questions. Uh, he made a, an, he said an extra note, uh, like personalizing news, i.e., Facebook, is kind of what he was going toward, um, for what it's worth. You could in your custom web parts for sure, because you know, if you know who the user is, you could then use uh, SharePoint Graph API to go get stuff that would be relevant to you. So you can personalize it by saying, hey, go get me my OneDrive, or go get me the graph. Uh, what Graph says is the most relevant documents to me, and you could then display that as me. Uh, you could easily use Graph to go get my calendar or to get my tasks that are that are personalized to me using SharePoint Framework to go get to Graph, and that that's totally valid. I'm thinking personalization beyond that. Let's say true audience targeting of if a web part should be shown if it's a given type of user. Uh, in classic SharePoint web parts, you could more easily target a web part for certain types of users. SharePoint Framework doesn't quite have that so natively, but you could certainly do it. Awesome. There you go. Oof. Thank you, Joe. 
Thank you, Joe, for that. Yeah, I got 26 uh, minutes, so I should be okay. All right. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> Thank you, Joe. Those are great questions. Uh, next one comes in from our friend Darlene. Uh, do you know if there are any SharePoint framework extensions out there for creating global navigation? Uh, yes, but I don't know. They're not fully polished, in my opinion. Um, a lot of people are talking about that. So building an extension that has a header, and in that header, it would go ahead and say, okay, hey, based on that header, uh, go ahead and show us navigation, and then that extension would be applied to everybody. Okay, uh, PMP is the place to go for that. I would search for uh, Google uh, SharePoint Framework Extensions uh, examples. I think that's it. So basically, it's github.com slash SharePoint slash, this is where, I, and hopefully someone will do it. Uh, if Ryan's on the call, I know he, he knows what the address is. Uh, it's uh, like SPFX uh, hyphen dev hyphen extensions or something. There's examples of this kind of stuff. And I'm pretty, that was like one of the first ones I ever saw was global nav, but it, it's not like ready for prime time in the sense you may still need to edit it, but at least it would give you a good idea how to do it. Gotcha. All right. Thank you, Darlene. It's a great question. Oh yeah. Uh, next yeah, question. Like yeah. yeah, definitely. Uh, next question is from uh, our friend Ruben. What is the better tool to use for building online forms with a CRUD functionality, SharePoint framework web parts or power apps similar to InfoPath? Microsoft is going to say power apps and I'm not going to disagree with them. Uh, it's a browser based tool set that allows you to just kind of quickly build these things. If you want more control, you're going to need to go SPFX. That's going to be my quick one minute answer for you. So I would I would try power. Like I said, try uh, start with modern and go to classic. I would argue start with power apps. Try to do it. See what you can do. If you can't find an answer, uh, keep googling a little more. If you still can't, then go to SPFX where you now have full control. You could basically do anything you want once you go to SPFX. But you're building a custom form control, and that could take time. Gotcha. All right. Thank you, Ruben. Great question. Um, uh, our friend Will has been asking some pretty great questions all throughout. Says Power App seems pretty clunky to me at this yeah. point. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sorry. That's probably the nicest way you could put that, Will. <laughs> I, I mean, it, that's. It, I know that Microsoft is putting a lot of investment in it, and they really, in my opinion, they very much want it to be the uh, InfoPath replacement. Uh, all that in flow, and uh, it, 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 they're trying. They're fully invested in it, and they're, they're they have got a lot of investment coming to it. I guess that's the best way to put it. It's not doing everything InfoPath can do. So if you need more, you point. might need to look at an Intex or, or a K2, or you're going to have to look at SPFX and do a specific form. But then with SPFX, unless you build a really complex web part, it's going to be more tailored to that specific implementation. Like you would build a form in an SPFX web part. You would define the output to be this form, and if you wanted to change it, you'd have to redeploy a whole new web part, which kind of is a shame. Now, there are ways around that, but you're, you've added on, instead of a, a 10, 40-hour project, you've added it, you know, you might have had a zero there, or you might have increased it from a week's worth of work to a month's worth of work to do what you might think is simple, but it's, it's, it's much more complex. How am I doing on gotcha. power here? No, battery saver. Very good. Uh, the, the excitement of live webinars, folks. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, there you go. Uh, well, that was the the last of the questions okay. people had sent in at that time. If anybody has any more questions, shoot them on in uh, while we're in our final minutes here. Um, again, this is Eric's favorite part of his sessions is the Q&A. Oh, yeah. That's where he really gets to geek out. So please shoot questions uh, over if you got any. Um, while, while, while we're waiting for those to come in, I will tell you guys a little bit more about some other stuff we got going on. If you are in the California area like we are, uh, we are part of a couple of really great user groups uh, in the area. Um, we are part of one in the kind of East Bay opened area. It used to be East Bay SharePoint user group is now called Bay Area Cloud Practice user group. And they are doing their first uh, meetup of the year. Uh, it'll be a session on Microsoft Teams. It isn't, it, it's, uh, it's unfortunately not broadcast live or anything like that. It is uh, an in-person kind of thing. But if you're in the area, check that out. I will be there tonight as will some of the other uh, Pixelbell team members. Uh, if you go to meetup.com, M-E-E-T-U-P.com and search uh, NorCal Office 365 and SharePoint Meetup, you will find all the information there. Uh, our spe the speaker will be Satish Nepal. He's a great guy. He's done a couple sessions on OneDrive before and um, I love when he presents. He's very passionate about what he talks about. And Teams is just, uh, and I'm, I know Eric and I could probably talk about Teams for a whole other uh, session by itself, but um, it's always good to learn more about that. So if you're in the area, again, meetup.com and search NorCal Office 365 and SharePoint Meetup. 
Hope to see you guys there if you're in the area. Um, while I blathered on for all that whole 45 seconds, uh, not a whole lot came in. Okay. Eric, do you have any, uh, any, any other final thoughts you want to throw out there before we let no, our, no. our, I, our, I our family go? I kind of love this topic. I, I won't be surprised if we do this again in another six months on what's still the <laughs> latest because this is changing. I do feel strongly in what I, what I said today is still very valid, though. I still think that you'll get a lot out of it. Uh, and it's what I'm telling all the clients I talk to as well. So I feel confident that if you move to SharePoint Framework, you move to client-side development, that, that's certainly the way to go. I uh, appreciate everyone joining us. I kind of hope you like this new interaction we're looking to do. Um, We've been doing a lot more video in the office as well. I think that we're a remote office. I think that having personal communication is good. We like kind of being there and we're live. This recording will be up shortly soon, I hope, Michael, right? And we'll have a blog post or something on it. Yeah, so yeah. what we usually like to do, if anybody's new to these webinars, is uh, we will post the video, we'll post a little recap of it. Usually um, by Monday or Tuesday of next week is, is always my goal to get that done, and it'll just give a brief little recap, and the video will be up uh, there as well. Uh, speaking of these webinars, we have a couple really exciting speakers oh, yes, coming do. up, including one that's on this call. I think he's still on this call. Um, our dear friend Ryan Scouten, the SharePoint Knight, will be um, doing our, our webinar next month. His uh, session will be Site Designs and Site Scripts, <laughs> Templating for modern superheroes. I'm looking forward to that so, one. That yeah, one's going to so be more, good. That's going to be a really fun one. Um, Eric and I were just talking about site design, so that's mm -hmm. perfect perfect time to bring that topic up. Uh, I will have more information about that in the next couple weeks um, while I'm still fi uh, finalizing things with Ryan. And then after that, we're going to have Erica Telly, who's another wonderful um, person in the Microsoft community. She'll be our uh, what's it's this is ever at March. She'll be April. <laughs> She'll be our April session. Uh, and then in May, we're going to team up with our friends over at Kiefer Consulting to do a kind of a joint webinar. Uh, still working out the kinks on that, but we will have that information shortly. Um, with that, it is 12:15, so we'll let you all go. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, if, uh, if you have any feedback or anything, hit us up at Pixel Team on the Twitter or pixelmail.com. Uh, if you're looking for Eric, you can find him at uh, ericoverfield.com or at Eric Overfield. Uh, he'd be happy to answer any questions you may have forgotten or come up with later or send them on over to the Pixel team as well. And we'll get those to Eric and we can always include those in our wrap up. Um, again, we're, uh, we're out of time, so I'll let you all go. Thank you again so much for joining us today and have a great rest of your day. Thank you all. See you all soon. Bye. Bye, folks.